Well, welcome everybody. My name is John Worth. I am the chair of the North Coventry Township Environmental Advisory Council. We are sponsoring this series of uh, educational webinars. This is the first of our series in 2021. Uh, this program is being recorded. Just so that you know, it is being recorded so that those who could not attend uh, this evening will be able to access it and view it later. Uh, our first uh, presentation in this series is from Chris Wells. Um, Chris is a member of the Valley, Valley Forge Audubon Society uh, Board of Directors. He's going to be talking to us about backyard bird feeding. Uh, I will also encourage you to tune in next month. Um, on February 10th, we'll have another presentation. It'll be titled The Wonderful World of Bats. That'll be on February 10th at 7 p.m. Um, and I hope you can join us for that one as well as our future webinars that we have planned. Now, as I said, Chris is on the Valley Forge Audubon Society Board of Directors. He's also uniquely positioned to tell us about bird feeding because he is the co-owner of the Wild Birds Unlimited store in Collegeville. Um, and uh, I think many of us who do pay attention to birds and have for a long time are certainly interested in this topic. But I think many of us over the last, oh, shall we say nine to 10 months have probably become more interested in birds as we spend more time at home. So with that, Chris, I will uh, let you get started. And again, I would encourage everyone to uh, keep yourself muted. We will have a chance for questions. In fact, using the, the uh, chat function in your Zoom meeting, that is down at the bottom of the screen, you can type in questions and I will read those to Chris when his program uh, is over. So with that, Chris, please take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much, John, and uh, let me express my appreciation for, for doing this. This is a very in, uh, topic, obviously, that's interesting to me. One thing we're do going over the web, and we have like 60 participants, so if for some reason I'm referring to a slide that you're not seeing, please let John know in the chat, and I'm going to share my screen. And John, if you could just make sure that you can see my screen. Uh, my slides and let me know. Yep, I can see your slide, your first slide. Okay. And now perfect, you're in presentation mode. Okay, thank you. Um, let me talk a little bit about what we're gonna, we're gonna go over backyard birding and um, some of the pleasures of it. And before we get started, John's gonna answer a question, we're asking me questions at the end, but let me go ahead and start with a question that I get asked quite often. Does feeding, if I feed the birds in the spring and the fall, does that slow their migration? Do they not migrate because there's food? And let me say that there's no scientific evidence to support that. Uh, they've done studies and birds migrate and not because of the bird food, it's just they will migrate. So you aren't harming the birds at all by adding the food. The other thing is I want to talk about a concept that you see a lot in the birding literature, and that is the concept of slow birding. And let me kind of do a parallel. Let's say you're on a bird walk and you see a morning dove and you go, OK, there's a morning dove. You check it off the list and you keep walking. Well, the other day where this summer I was in the backyard and I saw two morning doves and they were right next to each other and they were kind of cooing and, and rubbing their heads together. And then they made it and then they flew off. What was exciting about that, if I was on a bird walk, I probably would have missed that behavior. And that's the great thing about backyard birding is you can pick up behaviors of birds and how they feed, okay? So what are we gonna go over today? We're gonna to go over why feed the birds, who benefits from it. We're gonna talk about the foods to offer to get the most birds. We're gonna talk about all the different types of feeders and accessories. And then we're gonna talk about how to keep the birds safe. Okay, so the first thing is feeding birds is more for the people than it is the birds. Birds get somewhere between 10 and 30% of their food from Bird, food, bird feeders, where um, the rest of it they get from the plants and natural environment. Now, the 30% probably comes from, you know, during breeding season or during bad weather or, or times of change. 
but studies have showed that most of their diets do come from natural resources. So it's more for the people than the birds feeding them. And it's just a way for you to connect with the bird and to become more familiar with the birds. It's a way for you to watch how they interact and just make a closer connection to, to the bird feeding. This is a quick summary of all the different types of seeds that are available. So we're gonna do a quick review and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about them. The first is black oil sunflower, and this is real popular. Cardinals like it. And a lot of times the birds will be attracted to the black shells. So that's one type. Um, the next is the sunflower chips. If you put nothing out, no, uh, no other foods, sunflower chips is the primary one. That is the, the gourmet food for the birds. Almost all the birds like the sunflower chips. They go to the sunflower chips. There's no mess, but it is very, very popular with the birds. The next is the white millet. Now, birds who come to your bird feeder don't like millet, so they'll throw it on the ground. But then what happens to it? Then the ground feeders, like your dark-eyed juncos, your sparrows, your morning doves, they will eat the millet. So nothing really goes to waste, but the millet, it does help with the ground feeders. And I'm somebody who I really enjoy watching the ground feeders, and that's why I like having the millet with the dark-eyed juncos and things, the other birds. The next is the safflower. Now, this is called the problem solver. And it's called the problem solver because starlings and grackles don't like safflower. The starling is an interesting bird in that their jaws are very strong for opening, but not so much for closing. So they really can't eat this seed. One time this summer, we were overrun by starlings. I swear, we must have had generations of starlings. So I let all the food go down and then I put out nothing but safflower. Now we did lose some other birds, but we also lost all the starlings. Our neighbors weren't happy, but you know, cause they went to their feeders, but th that's called the problem solver because of that. The other reason is the literature will say that squirrels don't like safflower because it has a bitter taste. Birds cannot taste um, flavors, they, but they can taste nutrition and freshness. So the safflower has a bit of a bitter taste, which doesn't bother the birds. And the literature will say that the squirrels won't eat it. I can tell you right offhand that my squirrels have not read that chapter of the book. I've sat in the back and read it to them that they don't like it, but they don't seem to listen. So, but in my case, the safflower was eaten by squirrels, but only when everything else was gone. The next is this Niger, which is commonly called thistle. It's the same thing. We had somebody come in the store the other day and said, what's the difference? It's just the same seed. Thistle or Niger is very popular with the smaller birds like the finches. But one of the things is it is one of the seeds that if it's not stored properly can go stale. And I'll tell you the trick to telling whether it's a stale seed or not. Put it on a white piece of paper and rub it with your thumb. Remove the seed. And then if you have a little oil spot, then it's fresh and it's okay. If you don't have the seed, any oil, then that means the seed's gone stale and you might as well throw it away. You really wanna make sure that the niger stays fresh in the feeder so that the birds don't lose interest in the seed and the feeder. The next is peanuts. And who doesn't like whole, you know, whole peanuts or split peanuts? Um, you know, of course your nut, nut, um, nut hatches, your woodpeckers, and they love those peanuts. Do not serve the peanuts that you buy in the store, the ones that are salted and cooked. You wanna make sure that these are, are peanuts that you get from a seed store. And the last is suet. Suet is very important this time of year. It is basically fat and birds can lose up to 70% of their body fat outside on a cold night. That's why my wife makes me sleep outside. She hopes it helps. I can tell you it hasn't so far. But suet is something that birds like year round and they really like during the winter. If you put out suet in the summer, you wanna make sure it says no melt on it 
or else when you walk out after one of those hot, humid days, you're going to have a bunch of goo at the bottom of your feeder. Okay. Then you have some specialty foods, and like the fruits, which would attract, the, as you can see here, the Baltimore Oriole. Um, Baltimore Oriole gets its name because it's the same colors as Lord Baltimore. It has nothing to do with the city. It had to do with Lord Baltimore. They're kind of a hard bird to attract in that they don't travel in flocks. And we've been trying to attract them for years. We finally got one a summer ago, but we didn't get one last summer. So, but they like oranges. So, you, you know, if you put out a half of an orange, they, they, you know, they will like it. Hummingbirds, this is a nectar. And we're gonna talk about each of these a little bit more. But one of the things is you want to make sure two things are really fresh. One is your nectar, and one is that you have a clean bird, you know, hummingbird station. Hummingbirds like it very clean. The easy way to tell whether your nectar is fresh is just looking. If it looks a little cloudy, you need to change it. And the last is mealworms. Now, mealworms are loved by bluebirds. I can tell you, though, I put out mealworms every day and haven't gotten one bluebird. The, a coworker I have hasn't put out the first mealworm at all and she's overrun with bluebirds. She called me this morning and said she saw three of them on her fence. I think she does it just to torment me. But mealworms are good. One of the things is on mealworms, it does say on the package, not for human consumption. So if you buy a pack of mealworms and you're driving home and you're a little hungry, go for the chips and not the mealworms. And we're going to talk a little bit more about mealworms as we go through. So sunflower seeds were chips. They're eaten by almost all the birds. They're, they are very good because they're high in fat. And the chips are a little bit more expensive, but you get a lot less waste. Birds with small beaks, such as the goldfinches, have trouble cracking open the sunflower chips. So that's why, or sunflower seeds, so that's why they like the chips. Um, you may only want to put out one type of seed, this is it. Sunflower chips, if this is the only thing you're going to put out, this is what you want to put out. The next are peanuts in the shell. Now those are enjoyed by woodpeckers and blue jays. One of the things that's interesting to watch when a blue jay eats a, wood, eats a peanut that's in a shell, and if they have access to a lot of them, they will pick up the peanut, shake it, and put it down. Then they'll pick up another peanut, shake it, and put it down. And what they're doing is they're seeing whether which one's the heaviest. And they've done studies with birds, with blue jays, where they put out plastic peanuts that were almost identical in weight, but the blue jays could, defend, could discern which one was the heaviest and which one wasn't. So what they'll do is they'll take the heaviest one and go cash it, restore it, come back and get the next one. If you watch a blue jay when he eats, and this is the interesting part of backyard birding, when they eat the peanut, their throat actually gets bigger. And the reason is this, they have a sack right here under in their throat where they store the peanut shells, where the peanuts in the shell, and then they go hide them. And of course, woodpeckers like them. Uh, peanut splits are enjoyed by cardinals, chickadees, blue jays, woodpeckers, titmice, almost anything. But again, you want to, if you're getting peanuts, don't go to the grocery store and get peanuts. You know, you don't want to get the ones that are, um, are, you know, roasted and salted and all that. You want the raw peanut that's the best for them. Okay. Niger, we talked about Niger and the, it, is, it is a rather expensive seed. And you want to make sure that you store it in a cool, dry place and it does spoil easily in the heat. And again, the easy way to test whether it's fresh or not is put it down, put one seed on a piece of paper and rub your thumb on it and then look for that little oil stain. It does require a special feeder. And, but this is really good for goldfinches, house finches and pine siskins. And we've seen actually a lot of pine siskins this year in our backyard. So uh, they do like the Niger. The next is the white millet. And what the white millet is, is again, that's mostly for your ground feeders, your sparrows, your juncos, your doves, and your cardinals. Um, I 
most of your blends will say that it has millet in it. It's a little yellow seed. And it's not that it's a bad seed, but the birds who come to your feeder, it's kind of a little seed, so they'll throw it down and they want the bigger seeds. But the white millet goes down on the ground and it's really good and it, um, for the ground feeders. Safflower, we talked about that, and that is avoided by grackles and starlings. I don't think we have a day in the store where people don't come in and say, what can I do about the starlings? I'm overrun with the starlings. And any seed that has safflower in it will be good to get rid of, you know, to discourage the starlings and the grackles. Starlings are a nice bird. They're a pretty bird, but they are also a very aggressive bird that aren't native to America. They were brought over in the 1890s because someone wanted all the birds in Central Park that were referred to in Shakespeare's uh, plays. So that's how the starlings got here. But they're very aggressive and they tend to take over a bird feeding station. So safflower is good for that. And again, the literature will tell you card, um, squirrels don't like it because it's got a bitter taste. And like I said, I'm not so sure about that. Seed mixes. If you buy a seed mix, read the label. Avoid anything with Milo. Now, what is Milo? Milo is a filler. And what it is, it's a, it looks like a red seed. And birds uh, don't eat it. And so a lot of times you're fooled. You think, wow, the birds are really liking this because the seed's going down fast. And really what they're doing is they're just throwing it on the ground where it will become weeds for, for growth. Um, but anytime you're looking at buying a mixture of a seed, you want to be sure you read the label. A lot of the bird foods are kind of like the human foods in that they list the ingredients by how many, you know, by the quantity. Like, for example, they'll say this seed first because it's the most that's there. Well, Milo, if you see Milo, you just avoid that seed. Okay. Suet. This is really interesting because this is, it's commercially available. And you can come to stores and you can get a variety of it with nuts in it, with uh, seeds in it, even with mealworms in it. It's basically unprocessed so it can be found in the grocery store, in the meat store, or you can make your own. I have found almost every bird I have in my backyard likes the suet and will eat the suet. Even the um, dark-eyed juncos, which are supposed to be ground feeders, will go up to the feeder and eat the suet. Uh, but catbirds, nuthatches, and chickadees will all eat the suet. So, and of course, the starlings. Fruit is something that, again, the Orioles like. And the story is how the Orioles became to where they liked oranges is one year they were migrating and there was a big storm and the storm chased them over to Florida. Well, when they were in Florida, what does Florida have but a lot of oranges? And evidently the Orioles started eating them and liked them. So that's how they acquired a taste for oranges. They also like dried fruits and you can use jelly, but um, you might wanna be cautious. You don't want too much sugar in the jelly that you feed them. But dried fruits such as raisins and oranges are really good. Now I have found that the catbirds, mockingbirds, bluebirds and Orioles all like the oranges. Um, you do want to make sure it doesn't get rancid or, or, you know, so if you look and you see a lot of fruit flies or bugs and it looks all dried out, you'll want to change it because um, you want to make sure we're giving the birds the best quality of food. Nectar, which is what the hummingbirds eat, is one cup of sugar for, and four cups of water. And the, what I do is I boil mine. I just boil it because... I wanna make sure that the sugar dissolves evenly. So I will boil it until the sugar is totally dissolved. And, and then you wanna store it in a cool place such as your refrigerator. Do not add red dye. As I say, it's okay to give junk food to the kids, but not the birds. You don't wanna put red dye in it. It's not gonna attract them anymore and it's really not good for the birds. And you don't wanna use anything other than the white sugar cane, like the regular sugar you have on your table. One thing about storing the, the nectar, and this happened to us one time, because what I do is I, I would store it and then I'd put it in a water bottle and put it in the refrigerator. 
Well, I didn't have to worry about it because my wife knew what it was. Well, sure enough, we had some visitors or you know, some relatives come and they stayed with us. And one of them poured himself a glass of water and he goes, wow, that's some sweet water. I said, yeah, because it's not for you. It's for the hummingbirds. So if you do put it in your refrigerator, be sure to label it properly so that you know that it's hummingbirds. Mealworms, they can be purchased at almost any bird food store, pet store, or even online. They tend to be a little expensive compared to regular seed. Live mealworms need to be refrigerated. Um, we sell wild, you know, live mealworms and you can put out live mealworms in the summer. I wouldn't put out live mealworms now because you know, it's so cold there, they die right away. The birds do prefer the live mealworms only because the motion attracts them and they're a little juicier, but they do like the live mealworms. The only thing about mealworms is you don't wanna put a large number out. If you have the freeze dried mealworms and they get wet, for some reason, the birds will leave them alone and won't eat them. So you wanna make sure that you get the dried ones and bluebirds, robins, and other birds, especially during nesting season will like it because it's little, you know, it's high in protein. I have even seen my squirrels eating the mealworms, even though I told them they weren't supposed to. Now, we brought up our squirrels, dealing with squirrels. Squirrels are very intelligent, or they seem to be able to outsmart most anti-squirrel proofing things. So what can you do for it? Well, one thing is you can put hot pepper seed out and that will deter the squirrels. Now, I want to be totally honest with you. We will have hot, we sell hot pepper seed in the store and one customer will come in and say, wow, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. The squirrels have left it alone. And now I'm, you know, I don't have to worry about the seed. The next customer will come in and say, my squirrels must like spicy food because the pepper doesn't deter them. What I'd recommend is try a little bit at a time, you know, to begin with and see if that deters the squirrels. Because squirrels have saliva like we do, the pepper breaks down and it won't hurt the squirrel, but it would be just like if we ate a spicy meal. Birds on hand don't, of course, don't have saliva, so the pepper doesn't break down and it doesn't bother them. This, again, I would not put hot pepper flakes in the seed because that can easily get into a bird's eyes. So if you do get pepper seed, be sure that it's, you know, like cooked in or oiled, you know, with oil or something so that the seed, the, the oil, the uh, pepper, I'm sorry, doesn't get uh, loose. You could use a baffle to create a barrier for the squirrels. And you can also use a cage. Now, if you use a baffle, you want to follow the five, seven, and nine rule. Squirrels generally cannot jump more than five feet high. So you want to make sure that the baffle is at least five feet high. If you need help, ask my wife to come over. She's exactly five feet tall and you can measure how high the baffle is, but you want to make sure it's at least five feet high. Now I'll tell you a story. I have another job. And so I was at the bird store and somebody who I work with came in and they bought a baffle and they came up to me at work the next day and said, Chris, the baffle's not working. And I said, what do you mean it's not working? He said, the squirrels are just hopping right over it. And I said, well, how high do you have the baffle? He said, it's sitting on the ground. You know, that was like a step stool for the squirrels. So you want to make sure it's at least five feet high. You also want to make sure that it's seven feet from anything that they can jump from. For example, a tree, a branch, a fence. So you want to make sure it's five feet high and that the feeder is seven feet away from something that they can jump from. Also, squirrels are reluctant to jump more than nine feet down, which is really an amazing statistic. So when you're placing your baffle where your feeder, make sure it meets the five, seven, and nine rule. Some of our customers, or some of the people, our friends who do bird feeding, what they'll do is on one side of the yard, they'll have a bird feeding station. On the other side of the yard, they will have a squirrel feeding station where they put nuts and corn and things like that for the squirrels. Will it work? Well, it does to a point. You have to make sure that there is food in the squirrel. And if they can't see each other, it kind of helps. But that is something that can help. 
and like I said, we get three types of customers come into our store where talk to us about bird feeding. The first will say squirrels are animals too, and they have to eat. The second will say, I kind of like watching the squirrels. I want to buy things so that I can feed the squirrels. I like watching them run around. And the third will say, do you guys sell shotguns? Well, of course we don't. But those are the three types. But some people do like having a squirrel feeding station to deter the bird. I mean, deter the squirrels from the bird food. Bird feeders. So what makes a good bird feeder? I think most people could probably say, well, I understand the first two, that there's no sharp edges. We don't want the birds flying in and cutting themselves or hurting themselves. And you also want something sturdy, something that's going to hold up. Um, but the last two are two features that a lot of people forget. One is that you want a feeder that's easy to clean. And the reason for that is, is you want to make sure that the birds aren't picking up any diseases like conjunctivitis in the eyes and things like that. So you want to be, have a feeder that's easy to clean. And of course, you want one that's easy to fill. You want to make sure that you can fill it without too much trouble. And here's the big thing about easy to fill. You want to make sure you can fill it without spilling too much seed. You don't want to spill all your seed while you're filling the bird feeder and then have the birds just eat on the ground. So there are types of bird feeders, hoppers, two feeders, tray feeders or platform feeders. And I will tell you when we get to it exactly why I like the platform and tray feeders the best. You have a suet, peanut, nectar, thistle feeder, and other special feeders. Each feeder has a purpose and each feeder can help with each bird. So here's the hopper feeder. And you notice the hopper feeder with the blue that's got the cardinal and the downy woodpecker. Now let's kind of pause for a second with a little trivia. They're called cardinals because when the settlers came over from England and they saw the bird the first time, it reminded them of a Catholic cardinal with the little tuft and the red and the black. So that's why they were called cardinals. And you can see a couple of features about it. Like, let's look at this brown one. You can see there's a little trough so that water will run out of it. One of the things about bird seed is you can't overestimate the importance of having it fresh. And if it gets wet and gets moldy, then the birds will lose um, interest in your bird feeders. These aren't really, you know, totally waterproof or weatherproof. So they may get wet and moldy. And what I always tell people is during the, if it's going to be a rainy season or a rainy couple of days, don't put as much seed out. You know, you want to hold back a little bit. And this other one with the um, house finches, and the, and the gross beak, those are interesting birds to get to your feeder and they will come to a hopper feeder. And of course, you know, you can tell these are easy to fill because you lift them up. And, um, but these are basically hopper feeders. These are the tube feeders, which are cylinder. And I want to talk about each one. The first one with the cage around it. What the cage is good for is doing two things. One is keeping the squirrels out. And you see it's recessed enough where a squirrel can't reach in and grab the seed. The, under, the negative thing about it is some of your bigger birds, such as your um, blue jays and cardinals, can't seem to, you know, can't fit into the cage. So if you want to see those birds, you may not want to get the cage, but the cage will stop the squirrels. The blue feeder over here um, is obviously just a good, you know, seed feeder. The one with the red-bellied woodpecker, the cardinal, the goldfinch, has a tray at the bottom. And that tray at the bottom has a purpose. One thing is a lot of times the birds will, in order to get to the seed they want, throw out the seeds that they don't like. Unfortunately, this isn't something my mother would let me do when I had vegetables. I couldn't throw them out and then eat the part of the food I wanted. But squirrels are able to do that. And this tray down here will catch a lot of the seed. And then other birds, such as the cardinals and nuthatches, can get to it. This green feeder with the cardinal, that is called the eliminator. And this is, as I say, is like the Cadillac of bird food feeders because first of all you notice it has a very wide cylinder so you can put a lot of seed in there and you don't have to worry about it 
It's called the squirrel buster because you can, when the squirrel gets on this perch, it drops down and, the, and they can't get to the food. Then they jump off, it comes back up, and then the birds can get to the food. So this is why it's called the eliminator. Now, one of the reasons I say this is the Cadillac of bird feeders is if you notice right in the middle, there's a spring. So you can either make it real tight or real loose. So if I don't want like the starlings and other birds to perch here and eat, then I'll make it loose. So then only the chickadees and titmice can get there without it dropping down. So that is, and it's very hard plastic. So again, this is a squirrel buster. Is it 100% squirrel proof? I'd like to tell you it is, but it is very efficient at deterring the squirrels. The next is the platform or tray feeder. And these are my favorite feeders. And I'll tell you why. One of my hobbies is taking pictures of birds. Well, if I have the hopper feeder and I'm on one side of it, the bird always is on the other side. How he does that, I'm not really sure how he figured it out, but he is. But these are neat feeders because of a couple of reasons. Like, let's look at the one with the cardinals and the chickadee and the goldfinches. A platform feeder like that, a lot of times you'll see cardinals as ground feeders and dark-eyed juncos and things like that. They will come to a platform feeder and you get a better view of them. The other thing is like you see the platform feeder right above that with the cardinal and the house finch and the goldfinch. The, you know, again, it has a little bit of a roof, but it's a platform feeder, which makes it accessible to a lot of birds. And the other two are sitting on the ground. The one with the cage, of course, is to deter the squirrels. And the one with the roof helps keep the seed fresh. Now, one of the things I was, wanted to talk about is we talk about slow birding. We're watching how birds behave. And what's interesting about that is during the winter months, like now, birds will grab seed and they'll cache it. They'll go store it. Cornell did a study in which a chickadee visited a bird feeder 200 times in one day. He would grab one seed, go and hide it and come back and grab another seed. And that's what's interesting to watch about bird behavior is you can see some birds like woodpeckers and um, blue jays will, or I mean, I'm sorry, just blue jays, they'll grab a lot of seed, store it in their throat, and then go eat it. Where other birds, like a chickadee, will grab one seed, go store it, or even go eat it, like a titmouse will go grab one seed. So some birds are grab and goers, and some, some birds are stay and eaters. So watching those behaviors is really interesting. The other interesting thing about watching bird behavior at a bird feeder is you can see, so for example, at my bird feeder, we have a red-bellied woodpecker and he is the king of the bird feeder. When he gets to the bird feeder, even if the starlings are there, he will chase them away. He will deter them. He's like the king. And then the starlings and then other birds on down. Even within the same species, you'll see one bird that's dominant than the others. And that gives you an idea where the term, the pecking order came from. One thing about these ground feeders, unless you have a fence like this, they will attract the chickadees and the squirrels. So, and I'm sorry, the chipmunks and the squirrels. Here's the suet feeders. And this first one you can see is a basic suet feeder, the one that's hanging. And, you know, that's simple enough and it will work. The one below it with the red-bellied woodpecker, that's an upside down suet feeder. And as you can tell, it's good for clinging birds such as nuthatches and woodpeckers. The one in the middle and the other one are just plain suet feeders. One thing I like about the one that's in the middle with the downy woodpecker and the chickadee is that it has two suet cages. And a lot of times I like to put out two different types of suet so I can see which ones the birds go to and which ones they like more. But this is kind of a, a suet is so important, especially for this time of year because of the body fat and other issues. Peanut feeders. This is, um, I personally like watching blue jays and woodpeckers. And as you can see, the circular one, you can put the whole peanut in. Now, a lot of people say, well, can squirrels get to it? Well, yeah, they can. But also blue jays can. And I enjoy just watching a blue jay. And like I said, a lot of times they will swallow it 
and then fly and then go hide it. And blue jays are really good about hiding the food as the other birds during the winter. And they can remember where they hit it. Um, and that's one of the questions is, okay, like that one chickadee who visited the feeder 200 times, does he remember where he hit him? As long as nothing physical changes, as long as you don't take a tree down or move, a, move branches, you know, move things around, they will remember where they hit it. And then they will can, can go back in the winter. And you can see that both of these feeders are very popular with the woodpeckers and the blue jays. And then you also have the mesh feeders which feed the, which have the peanut splits. And the peanut splits will uh, attract like nuthatches and woodpeckers and other birds like that. So I really like um, these, I like the ones with the rain guards too, because that keeps the seed a little fresher and the cylinder can help, you know, it helps protect the cylinder from the rain. One other thing about, that's kind of interesting about blue jays you can notice is they are part of the crow family. So they're very intelligent and they can imitate other birds. So what can happen is they go to a feeder and if there are a lot of birds around, they will make the sound of a crow or a hawk. And then all the birds fly away and then they go and eat. So that's one of the funny things to watch in when you're watching behaviors about bird feeders. Nectars. Okay, this is again um, real easy to make. It's just four parts water and one part sugar. The feeders can have a water reservoir, and like the one that has the this um, ruby throated hummingbird, you can see where the where the pole comes down, where the the support comes down. There's a little hole right there. Or this one to the left of that that has the red. What that is, is those are ant guards. So the ants smell the nectar, they climb up, they crawl down, and then they go into the ant moats and drown. Now, my birds will drink out of there, and I think they think of it as protein water since it's got all the ants in there. So generally, you want a moat in between and then change. The other thing is you can get bee guards because the nectar will attract bees. And it's a guard that goes inside the, beer, the hummingbird feeder. And basically it separates the guard, um, the nectar from the feeder. Hummingbirds have a very long tongue and it's a forked tongue. And that's what they use to drink with. So they can go put their tongue in, grab the nectar and leave where bees can't with the bee guard. The other thing you can do is not fill the nectar quite so high. Don't fill it all the way to the top, fill it a little lower so that the birds can't reach it. I'm mean, sorry, the bees can't reach it. One thing about this is you do want to make sure it's clean and you also want to make sure that it is fresh nectar. And three to five days is a good, um, good way to choose or a good way to evaluate, you know, to change it. But also I look and make sure whether it is a little cloudy. The other thing is that's interesting about birds is they have a phenomenal memory. And if you had hummingbirds once, you will have hummingbirds again because they can remember every place they went. If you put a hummingbird feeder out for the first time, you want to think of the phrase a bird's eye view. You want to put the feeder someplace where if a bird hummingbird is flying over migrating, they look down and they can see your feeder. You may want to put plants out that are red or even put a red you know, cloth, but you want to make sure it's someplace, if you haven't put it out before, where a bird flying over would be able to see it. And again, think of the phrase, a bird's eye view. Now, I've had all kinds of birds drink out of the ant moat, not only hummingbirds, but all kinds of birds. So that's the, the other thing about hummingbird feeders is a good time to put them out. There are websites where you can track hummingbirds migrations, just like you can Oriole migrations. April 15th is a good easy day to remember because that's tax day. That's when the taxes are due. So it's kind of a good time to put out the hummingbird feeder. Now, this is the thistle or Niger. And you basically have three types. You have the mesh right here, the sock and the feeder right here. So remember this seed spoils very easily. 
So one of the things too is a lot of birds, as you can see these goldfinches, most of them are eating from the top down and the goldfinches on the mesh feeder and the sock feeder. So when you put your Niger in there, you want to mix it up. You want to make sure that the Niger isn't always at the bottom. And especially with the sock, you can always get a little clump of seed down at the bottom. So you want to make sure that that's cleared out. The other thing is if you have a rain guard, that is a big help. The advantage of the mesh and the sock is that they have more ventilation so the seed can dry quicker but they can also get wetter than like the one that's above with all the goldfinches. Again, this seed is a seed that spoils very quickly. So just test it, see if you get a little oil. And if you don't, you wanna change the feeder. These are the specialty foods. And I call these little treat feeders. And what you can do is you get a little treat feeder and you put a little, few little mealworms out. And again, you can see this one attracted a lot of bluebirds. My mealworms seem to attract a lot of squirrels, but we'll leave that topic for another day. So you, the reason you don't want to put a lot of mealworms out, again, if it gets wet, the, the birds will ignore it. And also you can put out oranges, as you can see here. Now, I've had more luck with half of an orange than a quarter of an orange, and I can't explain why, but both, both oranges will attract um, Orioles and other birds, such as catbirds. I'll tell you a quick story. It was sometime right after Christmas, a customer came into our store and said, what do I feed a Baltimore Oriole? And I said, I can tell you, but they're not in this area. They're, they're, they've already migrated. And he said, no, I have a picture of one. And he brought the picture in. And sure enough, he, it was a female Baltimore Oriole that should have migrated. But we had a big storm right before Christmas and that altered some of their migration. So, but if you just, you can put the nectar out and you can also put the oranges out and the blue and the mealworms for the bluebirds. And if you get bluebirds, congratulations, just don't come to the store and tell me because I'll be real jealous. So what are some accessories? Well, you can always get these rain guards as you see on the eliminator. And you can kind of see the chickadees there and he has access to the seed. So there's a little rain guard there. And the other two have caps on it, which are rain guards. They will help deter the squirrels. Um, and, um, but they will also help keep your seed a little fresher because you have the rain guard. If you're gonna buy one accessory, I would buy the rain guard and it will keep your seed a little fresher. So these are baffles. These, and remember the rule about the baffle. You want it at least five feet high and at least seven feet from something a squirrel can jump from. This baffle that's in the middle, that's the longer, oh, I'm sorry, that's the longer one. What that is, that is primarily for woodpeck, I mean, uh, raccoons. So the other baffles will help deter the squirrels. One other animal, and I always tell people, if you lose your seed at night, it's generally deer or raccoon. If you lose it during the day, it's probably squirrels. Now, let's say you do get deer. Just make sure that the feeder is at least six feet high, and that will deter the, the deer from coming there. But these other baffles do work. And actually, I have a baffle kind of like the cylinder one that's and it's really comical to watch. The squirrels will run right up the pole, right into the baffle, then climb down and look back up and climb back up. But so this is the, the baffles. Some people like to put grease on their pole and that's not really a great idea because that can get onto a bird's feathers and you know make it harder for them to fly. The other thing about the grease is that it does wear off. So, but these baffles do work. And as long as you follow the rules about five, seven and nine. So here's the bad thing. If you have a bird feeder and you get a lot of birds, you're going to get hawks generally. The two hawks that are in this area are the sharp shin hawk and the Cooper's hawks. Yeah, and they will eat at your bird feeders and they have to eat at least a bird a day. That is the part of the life cycle. If it bothers you, what, and you see the hawk in the area, take your fee feeders in because if they don't see birds, they're gonna go someplace else to hunt. 
also have dense shrubs and bushes around your feeder, not real close, but around the feeder, so that if they do hear or see the hawks, they can fly into the bushes and hide. One of the neat things about watching a bird feeder is what they call a, a feeding guilds. And that's when you get a lot of different bird species at your bird feeder. And you'll see that for two reasons. One is there's protection in numbers. And what's really interesting is like a chickadee, if he sees a hawk and he'll make a distress call, you know, like there's a hawk, other bird species know that what that means and they will, they will leave also. So that's one of the interesting things about watching the bird feeding behavior. But if it does bother you that a hawk grabs a bird every now and then, like I said, take your feeders in, the hawks will move on to, to other feeders or other places where there's more predators, and then you can put the feeder back out. Of course, you want to keep your cats indoors. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that limit them to cat exposure because they can get diseases and you want to make sure you're keeping your birds fresh. I mean, your feed fresh. <laughs> diseases. You want to clean your feeders every two weeks and you basically want to use soapy water and 10% bleach. Make sure that you clean it out well, real well and let it dry real well before you fill it back up but you do want your feeders and your bird baths clean. So be sure that they're air dried and rake around the ground. The other thing that hurts birds is window strikes. And one of the, one of the ways to avoid that is either have the feeder three feet or closer to the window or 30 feet away. Generally when a bird hits um, a window, it's because something has startled them and they fly and then they hit the window. Well, if they're closer than three feet, then they can easily avoid the wind. You know, they can't get enough momentum to hurt themselves. Or if it's 30 feet, then what happens is um, they have enough time to avoid it. You can also buy these opaque or window curtains and decals so that the bird can see them. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and turn this back over to John. John, how are we doing? Did we lose anybody? <laughs> I don't think so. No, okay. I don't think so. I think we've got a great, great attendance and we do have a number of questions that have come in, Chris. Okay. Okay, well, let's start with an easy one. Uh, is there a certain jelly to buy for Orioles? Grape jelly. Grape. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that uh, something low in sugar, you shouldn't, yeah. it shouldn't have a lot of processed sugar, right? Correct, absolutely. Okay. All right, next question, also uh, relating to feeding Orioles. <clears throat> How would I leave out oranges? On the ground, hang them from a tree branch? I would have them, we have, there are feeders that are specialty for holding the uh, oranges. I would not put them on the ground. Um, they're, you know, they could get too easily dirty and soiled. I would, we have them on the feeders. Now I have a platform feeder and what I do is I just cut the orange half and then I put like my wife makes fun of me because I, I put it out really artistically. I have oranges in each corner and different seeds and it looks real pretty until the birds get there. But I would put them up on a feeder that's specially that's made for either fruit, but I wouldn't put it on the ground. The other bad thing about on the ground is it does make it easy for predators like cats to get to them. So that's why I put it up on a, a platform. Is there a concern that dried mealworms come from overseas? Um, a lot of our seeds come, you know, like uh, the Niger comes from overseas, um, but everything else is pretty much local. I do know that that's something that's made them harder to, to get and a little bit more expensive, the fact mm. that they come from overseas. All right, next is how often should we clean the bird feeders? I want Every to two keep weeks. the birds safe. Every two weeks every two weeks mm -hmm. okay thank you let's see what is the, the best time of year for a hummingbird feeder april 15th is when you want to put it out mm -hmm. um and i always take mine in october 15th mm. there's no reason for october 15th generally to take them down you want to wait for two weeks after you've seen your last hummingbird um 
because you may, your hummingbirds may leave, but then other hummingbirds that are migrating may stop by and get a, a snack. And remember, these birds are going to fly from the United States all the way, you know, across the Gulf of Mexico. So they need a lot of that energy. But I would put it out April 15th. You want to put it out at least a week or two before they get here. Sure. So, so that it's, it's out there and well-established. Uh, there are a lot of websites that track the migration of the hummingbird. And, you know, things have just kind of gotten odd with some of the migrations. And sometimes they're coming earlier and later. A lot of it depends on the climate they're leaving. But I would put it out April 15th. And if not, check the websites for the migration. But you want it out two weeks before the birds come and two weeks after they leave. Sure. And certainly in this area, I mean, we've seen hummingbirds in the area as late as, you know, uh, end of October and even in well into November. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's like rare, a, but it does yeah. happen. Well, and like the, the story I told about the Oriole, I, you know, if I told you that there was an Oriole here in Christmas, you know, you would say, no, there wasn't. So, like I said, I always wait two weeks after I've seen the last hummingbird. Okay. That's a good rule of thumb. Um, let's see if we have any others. Uh, oh, we have several others that have come through. Okay. If the fun shaped feed blocks get wet, do they fall apart rapidly? I'm not sure what they mean by fun shaped. A lot of times you can get seed that's in the shape of a, um, of a, a wreath or shape of a animal or shape like that. They're held together with gelatin. So, mm. you know, a lot of times if you do get a hard rain, it will cause them to fall apart. Um, you can get a wreath holder, which will help keep it together. But if you know it's going to be a hard driving rain, you may want to bring your, your uh, fun shaped seed. Any way to get a, uh, a jay bird, presumably a blue jay, to stop chasing my cardinals away? No. <laughs> <laughs> Other I think than that's, you were talking about the pecking order at the yes. feeder. Mm -hmm. um, and I can say that I have seen at, at my feeder, I have seen times, I think it depends on the, the setting and the individual bird. Mm -hmm. I have seen cardinals stand their ground against blue jays when no other bird would. Yeah. And again, so, at, at our bird feeding station, it's the red bellied woodpecker that will stand his ground against mm -hmm. everybody. Um, the interesting thing is sometimes, like, it's not just blue jay. I mean, a, a one blue jay will maybe chase a, a cardinal away, but another blue jay won't. A lot of it depends on age and dominance, so. Right. And how hungry they are. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I just installed a window feeder, and I'm getting lots of activity. Are these feeders okay as far as safety? Yes. Because, again, the birds are flying to the feeder, so they're going to strike a window when something startles them or scares them like a cat or something like that's behind them and they're trying to flee. But if you have a window feeder, they will come up to the, you know, they'll, they'll instinctively know to slow down and they're focused on the feeder. So. Right. Are jams better than jellies? Um, again, I would just look at the sugar content. They do make jelly that's specifically for birds. Um, but mm. Are jams better than jellies? Um, I would think of something with more low sugar content and organic for the birds. Okay. Um, what is the easiest way to attract an owl? That is hard because most owls aren't, first of all, you could put up an owl house. Now an owl house will attract the smaller owls that are cavity dwellers, <clears> such <throat> as your barn owl and your screech owl. Um, your great horned owl is, will have a nest and they will typically take over a nest such as, um, you know, like an old squirrel's nest or something like that. So, but you're not going to typically see them at your feeder unless they're after another bird mm. or another animal, like a mouse or something like that. Well, that's what I was thinking. If you want to attract an owl, Invite mice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the best way to get an owl. Um, okay. How about cleaning a wooden bird feeder? Still use a bleach solution? I would, but I would maybe not have it as 10%, maybe get it down to 5%. Okay. Okay. But and they again, still need it, to be cleaned. Yeah. Cleaned and let it air dry real well. 
Are roasted peanuts in the shell bad for birds if they are not salted? Yes. They you are. Want, yes. You don't want roasted nuts or peanuts in the shell. Just get regular raw peanuts. Raw peanuts. <clears throat> All right. Will a hawk take a cat or small dog? Uh, there has been stories about that, um, about, you know, eagles were, were hawks taking, you know, uh, small dogs or cats. I, I have not known of that. What about you, John? Do you, have you? No, um, certainly not. You know, if you think about the hawks that are attracted to bird feeders, it is a, a, a Cooper's hawk, a sharp shinned hawk generally. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they will really not take anything much larger than, well, one, they'll take other birds, obviously, that's their, their primary. Um, but I, I mean, I've seen Cooper's hawks take chipmunks. Mm -hmm. So as long as your cat or dog is probably bigger than, <laughs> than a chipmunk, chipmunk or, or perhaps a gray squirrel, I think you're probably safe. The biggest I've seen is I saw a red-tailed hawk get a squirrel once. And but that's about the biggest animal. That yes, a red tail will take will certainly take uh, that. Maybe even a rabbit. Um, mm -hmm. They generally don't hunt at bird feeders. Right. Certainly, the sharp shinned hawks uh, and the Cooper's hawks will hunt at bird feeders. They're attracted by mm -hmm. the activity, the flying about of the, of the birds. Um, we've we had a lot of a lot of questions i really appreciate that i think that's a that's a good sign well this has been just a pleasure for me and i really appreciate it and i appreciate all the work the township and john and patty have done to put this together and let us host it and uh, i really this has been a pleasure for me and i really appreciate all the work everybody did in supporting it so thank you Thanks, Chris, for the presentation. Thank you, everyone who joined us this evening. I'd also like to thank um, uh, Valley Forge Audubon Society for co-promoting this event. Um, I'm uh, very grateful to them for uh, helping to promote this whole series. Thank you very much. Thanks, all. And happy birding. <laughs>